Well, good morning, church. Uh, since the start of the year, we've been circling around three intersecting and overlapping ideas. The year of the Lord's favor, the coming of the kingdom of God, and the goodness of God. In particular, we've been focusing on what it means to say that God is a good God. <clears throat> but there is a very hard question that leaps to the mind as soon as we say that God is a good God. As soon as we say that we are believing that this is the year of the Lord's favor, the time when he's showing us his love and extending his kingdom in our midst, and that question is the title of the series we're starting today. If God is good, why... If God is good, why is the question that is often unspoken but not very far from the front of our minds. It's the question that is asked by devout Christians and atheists, by believers and skeptics, by young and old. <clears throat> if God is good, why doesn't he do something about the pandemic? If God is good, why are children starving in Africa? If God is good, why did my grandma die? Why didn't he heal her after I prayed and prayed and prayed for him to heal her? If God is good, why did he let me? And then you can fill in the blank with your own experience of unjust or horrific suffering at the hands of someone else. This is not a new question. Explaining the existence of suffering and evil has challenged people of every age, every culture, every situation. We have examples of literature that are three to 4,000 years old from ancient Egypt and Babylon and India that address questions related to the problem of human suffering. We can read from the book of Job or the Psalms or the prophets such as Habakkuk, find lots of places where the author expresses his complaint or his questions about suffering. Greek and Roman philosophers debated the question. It's a perennial topic of academic discussion among scholars, and it is the subject of tortured conversations in hospital waiting rooms. And the passages we just heard from the Gospels of Luke and John show us that questions about why people suffered and why evil existed were in the minds of the disciples when they followed Jesus around in Galilee and Judea. We also have to understand that <clears throat> this is not a simple or easy question with a simple or easy answer. Hundreds and hundreds of books have been written on this topic, filled with dense and difficult scholarly philosophical arguments and a multiplicity of contradictory conclusions, all of them eloquently defended. Now, I don't pretend to be adequate to untangle the whole mind-boggling mess of academic discussion, and rest assured I have no intention of subjecting all of you to that headache-inducing gauntlet. <laughs> But I do want for us to look very carefully at a very difficult question for two very important reasons. First of all, I strongly believe that we need to be able to answer this question when it is asked by those outside the church, those who have honest intellectual objections to Christian faith because they cannot reconcile belief in a good God with the reality of suffering and evil in this world. Now, not everyone who asks this question is being honest about it. Let's just lay that out there. Some who throw this question at us don't really want to hear our answers. They just want us to stop talking about God. And for them, this question is not really a question about the existence or the character of God. It's more of a smokescreen that they want to hide behind so they won't have to face up to their own moral failures, won't have to face up to their refusal to acknowledge God's claim on their life. But there are some who honestly want an answer. And the fact is, it is a legitimate question. In fact, I consider this question to be the most, perhaps the only legitimate objection to Christian message. And I, I believe that it's one that every one of us needs to be able to answer. Sadly, we have not done a good job of that. But second, I believe we need to be able to answer this question because the vast majority of Christians wrestle with this at some point in their lives. <clears throat> many, many believers, perhaps many of you, live with a secret, haunting uncertainty about whether God is good or cares or even exists simply because you cannot reconcile what they've been taught about God 
with their experience of personal pain or their observation of the suffering of others. And doubts that grow from this question have led to more than a few people abandoning the faith that they once professed. And I'd like to see that reversed. Now, a few years ago, <clears throat> Lex Luthor Jr. laid the problem out for us in Batman versus Superman. And he did so in a way, in the way that it's most commonly expressed today. And I quote, the problem of evil in this world? Hmm? No man in the sky intervened when I was a boy to deliver me from daddy's fists and abominations. Hmm? I figured out way back, if God is all-powerful, he cannot be all-good. And if he is all-good, he cannot be all-powerful. Hmm? Now, I say that this is the way it is most commonly expressed today for, for two reasons. The first is this, the problem is usually stated as if it is a very simple binary choice, as if there are only two possibilities and each of them negates the other. So the assumption is that we must choose between these two options, one or the other. Option one, option one is that, well, there may be a God, but if so, this God is perhaps good but not all-powerful, or he's all-powerful but not good. And that option eliminates Christian faith altogether. Option two concludes, well, the simplest thing to do is just do away with the problem, deny the existence of God altogether, and that's the standard position that's taken by modern atheism. But second, the basis for this rejection of God is not intellectual, it's personal. The character of Lex Luthor Jr., who... I suspect serves as a channel for the screenwriter's actual views. He really nails the popular sense of the problem. And he states the case for multiplied millions of people in our society today, which is this. It is because of personal pain and personal suffering that I experienced from which God did not deliver me that I reject the idea that there is a good God who is all-powerful. Since he did not save me from my pain, either he isn't good or he isn't all-powerful or more likely he isn't even there. And at the very least, I am certain that he does not care. So don't tell me about this God who cares because he doesn't. Don't tell about this God who is good because he isn't or who can help me because he can't or he won't. I have no interest in him, no reason to believe in him or to follow him. That's the position that's held by multiplied millions today. So there we have the dilemma in a nutshell. And the problem can be stated quite simply. If God is all-powerful and perfectly good, why is there evil in the world? Or, as some have demanded, how can you believe in God after Auschwitz? Or Milai? Or the Sudan? or 9-11, or the last tornado, or tsunami, or hurricane, or tragedy, or pandemic, or, and the list goes on and on and on. To put it in its very simplest paradoxical form, Christian faith firmly asserts, and, and atheism flatly denies, that all three elements, not just two of them, all three elements of the following paradox are true. God is all-powerful and therefore is able to prevent suffering. God is perfectly good, number two, and therefore must want to prevent suffering. And number three, horrible things happen. How can we explain this? How can all three statements be true? How can we defend this? How can we hold out this truth for others who have been wounded by the evil and the suffering in this world? So I'm going to ask you to take a journey with me over the next couple of months through all the rest of Lent, through Palm Sunday and Easter and a little bit beyond that. I'm going to ask you to come with me because we're going to be going to school. It's probably not why you came to church. Lots of us, for lots of good reasons, we come to church, we want to be encouraged, we want to be inspired, we want to hear something from God that will keep us going through the slog of the week till we can come back next Sunday. And I understand that. I don't think that's unreasonable, I don't think that's a wrong expectation. 
But we also need to be built up. We need to be strengthened. You know, the football team doesn't just need the pep rally. You need the, the practice. You need the instruction and the, the training that equips us to succeed to be able to win the battles of the week. And so for the next two months, we're going to be focused on gaining some spiritual strength. We're going to exercise our minds a little bit. We're going to extra, exercise our hearts and our emotions, sure. The end result, I believe, I firmly believe, is that we will be encouraged and we will be better able to face the challenges of each week if we go through this together. Are you ready? You ready to do this? Should we begin? Let's start then by looking at some of the answers that are commonly offered up to explain the existence of suffering. And these come in various forms. There's versions of each of these that are sophisticated philosophical or religious systems, arguments, and there's versions that are just everyday popular cliches and slogans and ideas. I'm calling these answers bad answers, which probably demonstrates my bias. <laughs> what I mean is that these answers are inadequate for those of us who hold to Christian faith because they do not provide an adequate solution to the dilemma. <clears throat> I love this picture. I don't know if you can see it very well. <clears throat> can you see it? It's a, it, it these answers are like the paper plate that this guy is holding that used to have this marvelous dinner that he'd prepared for his date, which is now all over her lap. Okay? They aren't able to bear the weight that they are attempting to carry. Either the understanding of God that they present is inconsistent with biblical teaching, or the understanding of suffering and evil that they present is inconsistent with reality, or both. And they're also inadequate because they do not offer an answer that can actually help people deal with their pain in a way that allows them to affirm the truths of Christian faith. But you need to understand something else. Christians are not the only ones who have to answer this question. Every person, every religion, every philosophical system must answer the question of the existence of evil and suffering. And those who oppose Christian teaching often throw in our faces the reality of suffering <clears throat> as if just posing the question is sufficient to overthrow every reason for believing in God. But those who oppose our faith, well, they have to provide an adequate answer for the suffering and evil in the world. And I would submit that their answers, these alternatives that they suggest, do not provide a better explanation of why suffering exists or how to live. And the truth is that those who object to Christian answers, to theism in general, because of the problem of suffering and evil, they don't have a better answer themselves. And so these proposed answers are inadequate as an alternative to Christian faith and belief. Now, <clears throat> the first group of answers all come from outside the Christian tradition, but they've managed to seep into the thinking of some within the church. But all of them share this in common. They fail to adequately account for the presence of suffering and evil in the world. Let's start with the first one. Evil isn't real. Evil isn't real. There are those who try to answer the problem by denying the premise in some way, by denying that evil exists or denying that it's really evil. <clears throat> so, for instance, Buddhism, Christian science, and some groups that claim to be Christian, such as certain strands of what's known as the prosperity gospel, these all teach that it's our misunderstanding of reality that deceives us into thinking that evil exists. And what we have to do is overcome these misperceptions in our mind that have misled us. There's even an example in popular culture that drives me crazy because it's a common but it's completely incoherent belief. And it's expressed in this saying, it's all good. It's all good. I, I don't want to put too much weight on that because some people just say that because they're just trying to answer something. But if you take it seriously, this belief essentially represents the decision I'm just going to ignore any suffering or evil in the world. 
I simply exclude from my thinking, la, 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 la. <clears throat> Anything that disturbs my sense of peace. Now, this it's all good idea isn't as carefully worked out as Buddhist thinking or Christian science thinking, but it shares this very common characteristic with them. Essentially, the person chooses to ignore all the suffering that he or she witnesses or knows about, pretend that it isn't there, or pretend that what happened wasn't wrong, or pretend that it didn't injure anyone. Now, <clears throat> it ought to be obvious that this view is utterly insane. <clears throat> but there are multiplied millions of people who have convinced themselves that if I just ignore the pain, then it isn't real. It didn't happen. But try saying that to the mother who's sitting beside her son in the pediatric cancer ward gasping for his last breaths as he's dying. Try telling that to the father whose 14-year-old daughter was raped on her way home from school. Try telling them, it's all good. The evil that led to your suffering, it's not really evil. It, it, your pain isn't real. It's not all that bad. It's utterly insane. <clears throat> well, number two says evil is necessary. And so some try to hide behind this belief that good and evil have to exist in perfect balance in the world. Each is a necessary part of life in this world. And this all comes from what's known as Eastern pantheistic um, uh, mysticism. It's basic to Hinduism. It's basic to New Age religion. It's been popularized in a lot of different forms, most especially in the Star Wars movie, The Force. May the Force be with you, right? The perfect balance. Pantheism requires this because in, according to pantheism, God and the universe are one and the same thing. So we, we lift up prayers to the universe because we can't call them God, but they're all the same thing. And so suffering and evil are just a part of God, and so it has to be because God is everything. And what we see as evil or suffering, well, it's just imperfection in the process of being improved through various means. And once again, the absurdity of this view is stunning. And yet, you know, like any conspiracy theory worth its salt, if you repeat the absurdity enough times, people will believe it. But are we really going to insist that the world needs children to be molested so that we can have balance? Are we going to insist that we need genocide and human trafficking to offset the economic prosperity and comfort so the world can be balanced? That evil is necessary so that we can appreciate good? Let me ask you, would you applaud the father who beats his children senseless and then tells them they needed that beating so they could appreciate it when he gave them dessert. Would you? Of course not. And for that matter, if we're just being honest, the people who actually say these things, they typically don't follow through with their beliefs. They live very differently. They react very strongly against anything that threatens their own sense of what is unjust or what is wrong. And they champion their causes to eradicate what they view as evil, despite claiming to believe that the presence of evil is a necessary part of the world. Even Yoda, even Yoda leads the fight to defeat evil in order to bring back balance, the balance of good and evil. We're going to defeat evil in order to bring back. It's nonsense. Utter foolishness and completely hypocr hypocritical. And they dare to accuse us of being irrational. Please. There's a third answer that's often given. Evil simply is. See, some that are trying to sidestep the whole problem, they're not going to face the issue, particularly as it relates to the question, the existence, and the character of God. So, for instance, scientism, which is the conviction that strict application of the scientific method is the only reliable source of knowledge. Scientism, believed by a vast number of scientists and intellectuals in the world today, it's one system. Atheism is another that takes this. And for both of these systems, God is simply not allowed in the, in the equation. He can't be a presupposition. He can't be a possibility. And so moral questions don't have anything to do with God. They're relegated to the sphere of social science. And all the causes for suffering are explained in terms of societal failures. But the source of that is never explained. It's elusive. It's inexplicable. And for the most part, it's completely undefined. 
And so, for instance, for the last half century, we've seen the growth of a belief in not, not just in philosophical circles, but in, in the common lives of people, <clears throat> a belief that's known as nihilism, from the Latin word nihil, which means nothing. And this is the belief that nothing matters. Life is purposeless. Stuff just happens. Nihilists recognize that suffering and evil is there, but they refuse to examine the cause. They're, 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 they say, well, you just have to embrace pain and suffering. It's a given. It's the result of a meaningless, chaotic universe that's essentially random and incomprehensible. Stuff just happens. <clears throat> And you might think that doesn't have anything to do with real people in everyday life, but whether with or without the label, this kind of thinking is rapidly taking root and growing throughout our society and across Western culture. Some of the chief fruits that we see from this, uh, developing from a bankrupt philosophy, the growth of sadism and masochism. We see uh, the increase not just of increase of suicide, but the increase in popularity of suicides. Because suicide is the logical conclusion if you see yourself trapped in a pointless and painful existence. The fascination with risky and self-destructive behavior, these are all fruits of a belief that nothing matters, it's all meaningless, it's all random. And the fruit of this is actually to increase pain and suffering rather than solving the problem. But it's Evil just is. Nothing you can do about it. And once again, the people who actually say they believe this do not live consistently with what they say they believe. In fact, they find fault with those who won't join them in opposing the things that they think need to be eradicated, the things that they personally find evil, the things that threaten their own sense of security or then their sense of well-being or the wrongs that they think need to be fixed, such as the lack of cheap access to um, methods for anesthetizing your pain, drugs or alcohol or whatever. And once again, there's just plenty of ordinary people who haven't thought this through a lot, but they just, I'm just, I'm just going <clears> to <throat> shrug my shoulders and watch the world burn because it all, it's all meaningless. Each of these answers fails to deal adequately with the presence of evil, and the, the reality of suffering in the history of the world and in the lives of real people. Suffering and evil is an experience universally the case, and it can't be dismissed so easily. And people who are experiencing this won't be content with answers like this. And if these are supposed to be better alternatives, better explanations of why suffering exists and how we ought to live in the light of that, something that we're supposed to believe in instead of believing in a good God, I, those explanations fall very short, and I'm completely unconvinced. But there are also some inadequate answers that claim to represent Christian faith, or at least something resembling that. And they are bad answers, not because they're completely untrue like the first set were, but they're offered as complete answers when at best they are only partial answers. And so for instance, you might hear someone say that Satan is the cause of all suffering and all evil in the world. <clears throat> According to this idea, it's formerly known as dualism, Good comes from God because God's perfectly good and evil comes from Satan because Satan is perfectly evil. And it sounds very plausible at first, but it starts to fall apart once you start thinking about it. For one thing, all that really does is push matters back one step because if, if Satan is the cause of all suffering and evil in the world, well, why doesn't God do something about Satan? Why doesn't he stop him? Why do he even let him here in the first place? We still have the problem. And there are those who even mistakenly see Satan as sort of God's equal and opposite foe. And they're, they're, they're again, you're back to there's a, a necessary part of the universe, but that's not the case. He's a created being. But for another thing, this idea does not account for all of the suffering that God claims he's responsible for. Things like bringing judgment upon Egypt to let Israel out, bringing judgment upon Israel for their idolatry or punishing the wicked. Now we're going to come back to this in a few weeks, this notion in particular, but for now we're just going to say this is inadequate. It's too simplistic an answer for a complex problem. Well, the next answer is one I expect you've heard. Maybe you're still hearing in your brain, it's all your fault. 
you brought this all on yourself. It's the accusation we hear often from the voice inside our own mind. God is punishing you for some sin, known or unknown. Or you've failed to live up to his expectations, or you've failed to follow the proper ways of righteousness. You're reaping the consequences of your failures. This was the answer that Job's three friends repeatedly offered to their suffering friend. They insisted over and over and over, there's some sin that that you're hiding from us and you're hiding from yourself. There's some wickedness in your life, some corruption that you thought you could hide from God, but clearly God knew about it. And God has brought about these catastrophic calamities that you've suffered in order to demonstrate your guilt and to punish you for your sins. But the problem with their argument was that Job's sufferings were not tied to anything he had done or anything he had left undone because God himself said so. But Job's friends were sure. There was something because their theology said that good things come to the righteous and suffering comes to the wicked. And so if you're suffering, it had to be because he was wicked. The disciples of Jesus thought the same thing. When they saw the man who'd been blind since birth, they assumed that his blindness was a punishment. A punishment from God. And the only question was, well, whose fault was it? Had he sinned in some way before he was conceived or while he was in the womb? Or or was her parents the ones who sinned? Because if he's blind, then it's because he's being punished. And if he's being punished, it's because someone had sinned. But that isn't true. It is true that sin brings suffering, and there are painful consequences for wrongdoing. But it is not true that all suffering comes from sin. And if it isn't true that all suffering comes from sin, then it also isn't true that all suffering is an indication of sin. And the claim that all suffering is punishment for sin does not explain all of the suffering in the world. Jesus made that very clear when he brought up these two tragic incidents in Luke 13. He said to the disciples, you, you remember the slaughter of those Galileans that Herod murdered in the temple? Or, or the deaths of those 18 people when that tower fell on them, collapsed in Siloam? He says, were they worse sinners than the people around them? Of course not. No. Again, we're going to come back to this idea in a couple of weeks, but it's a, inadequate as an answer to why suffering exists if God is good. And there's another one. <clears throat> A very inadequate, very simplistic explanation, all too frequently given out by those who think they're defending God's goodness. It is a partial truth masquerading as a complete answer. God is trying to teach you a lesson. That's why you're suffering. C.S. Lewis made a famous statement to this effect in his lectures on the topic of suffering and in his book, The Problem of Pain. By the way, The Problem of Pain is a wonderful, powerful book one of the most important books that helped me understand about suffering and evil from a Christian perspective. I heartily recommend it. But he said in there, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. It's a very powerful statement. It's true to a point. And C.S. Lewis wielded that statement like a mighty sword in academic lectures and debates. But when he experienced the loss of a woman who had become his friend and then his wife, the woman who had brought love and joy into his life in a way he had never known before, his own statement became nothing more than a mocking platitude that was utterly useless for helping him deal with his own pain. And her suffering through bone cancer and her eventual death devastated Lewis. And he nearly abandoned his faith in the process. Listen, I know that God uses pain to get our attention. He uses it to teach us things. And there are a lot of benefits that come to us through pain. But God is not a sadistic monster inflicting pain on people solely for the purpose of teaching them a lesson as if he needed to prove that they're ignorant. And what possible lesson that someone allegedly needs to learn would explain an account for the pain of being raped 
for the murder of a child, for the fraud of a Bernie Madoff, for the genocidal actions of a Pol Pot or a Hitler. What possible lesson are we missing? So let me pause here for a little bit of very practical advice for you. Do not tell people who have suffered the loss of a loved one who are grieving for the death of their child or their spouse that God was trying to teach them a lesson. And don't try to console them by saying, God needed Bill in heaven so he killed your son or your, your brother or your husband or whoever. And that's just a different, more twisted version of the learning a lesson notion. It isn't true, and it doesn't help, and you don't know that. It just causes more pain, so keep your mouth shut. Or just tell them that you hurt too, and remind them that you care. That'll be a lot more helpful. All of these answers are inadequate for the same reason. They take one part of the truth, and they make it the determinative answer for all suffering and evil. But a reductionistic answer to a complex problem is not the truth. And what is even worse is that the people who make these kind of pronouncements claim to know much more than they can possibly know about people and life and spiritual reality and the conditions of people's hearts and the situations in which people find themselves. Now, there's one more answer that I think is an inadequate answer. There's a lot more, but I'm just talking about the major ones. <clears throat> there's one more I'm holding off on addressing it until later, and that's the answer of Christian determinism. It's one of those issues that could easily require several months of sermons all by itself or a, a lengthy class dedicated to nothing but that topic. If there's enough interest, perhaps we can explore it in detail in a uh, future pastor's class or something like that. But for now, I, I'm just going to look at it briefly in connection with one of the sermons later on in this series. So let me tell you where we're going. Because <clears throat> if we're going to come up with a good answer to the question, why is there suffering and evil in the world if God is good, we cannot be content with and we cannot settle for cliches and slogans and simplistic answers. A question this difficult and this complex requires a commensurate answer. The answer I'm going to offer you has eight parts, count them, eight. So over the next eight weeks, what we're going to do is look at those separate parts one at a time and build a framework for a better answer, a better way of understanding God, a better way of understanding the world he created, a better way of understanding our lives and how we can reconcile faith in this good, all-powerful God with the reality of suffering and evil in this world. I happen to believe that this is really important. I think that working through these eight parts to the answer will help you face your own doubts. It will give you ammunition for fighting those doubts off. It will help you explain to others who are struggling with their faith how they can hold on to God in the face of horrific pain. And it will help you clear away some intellectual hurdles for people that you talk to who can't understand why anyone with half a brain would believe in God when there's so much suffering in the world. But there are a few things that this sermon series will not do for you, cannot do for you, and I want to be honest about that from the very start. I cannot answer every possible objection to Christian faith, and this series will not enable you to do that. The good news is you don't have to try. That's, that's up to the Holy Spirit to do that. I can't answer every possible question. That would require omniscience, and even I don't think that's true of me. So that's restricted to God himself. And there's something else that's restricted to omniscience. And this is the one that's probably the hardest aspect of this problem for us to deal with. Because no one but God can answer the why of your specific situation. Why this particular pain? Why this suffering? Why now? Why me? But it'll still be helpful for you to be able to hear the answer to the general why, even if you can't know for certain the specific why that you're asking about. And even more important, what this sermon series cannot do at all is the thing that we all want, the thing we're looking for when we ask that question in the first place. We want someone to take away the pain that we're feeling, and only God can do that. But he loves to do that, and he's very good at it. 
and we can help put you in touch with him so that you and Jesus can have that conversation and deal with your pain. So while we're looking for that better answer, don't forget that you have to look to the only one who can help you, to the one who is good all the time, the one who was acquainted with grief and bore in his body on the cross our sorrows.